Welcome to our second lecture in the Brown Bag Lunch Lecture Series. Our presenter today is Megan Luttrell, and the topic is um, Color Line and Narrative, Visual Art Techniques in Tolstoy's Fiction. And I hear that this is also the topic of your dissertation. Yep. All right, and I've cleared it with <coughs> Megan that it's okay if I talk about other events simply because people tend to disperse at the end of the talk. And so tomorrow, uh, uh, there is the Council on Foreign Relations Conference um, lecture, Media Literacy in, in an Era of Fake News. And this is at 11 a.m. here in this room. On Thursday, we're showing a Georgian film, Tangerines, and Professor Eric Scott <coughs> from History is introducing this film. This is at 7 p.m. in this room as well. And um, our next brown bag lecture is, of course, next Tuesday noon, and this is Nate Pickett from Geography, and his topic is doing social science research in post-Soviet spaces. And also, for those of you inclined to go to Kansas City, uh, Professor Aniko Kobobo is giving a lecture on Monday, September 18th, at the Kaufman Foundation, and this is on Eugene Onyegin, the opera they're uh, putting on in a couple of weeks. So, this is the lineup of events. Anything else? There will be many more later on this semester, yeah. but for this week, that's a very exciting lineup yeah. that we have. So. Yeah, so the floor is yours. Thanks. Um, thank you guys for coming. Um, so, uh, as Justina said, I'm going to talk about um, part of my dissertation. This is mostly from my first chapter. So, in general, I'm looking at visual art techniques in Tolstoy from kind of the beginning of his career to the end. Um, and obviously it's a work in progress, but this is just kind of to give you an idea of what I'm doing and a way to look at Tolstoy in a new, in a new way. Um, so, um, in July 1851, Tolstoy wrote in his diary something that I find really interesting. He says, I will go along and describe what I see, but how can I write this? I have to go and sit down at the ink spotted desk, take out the gray paper and ink, smear my fingers, and draw letters on the paper. The letters form words, the words phrases, but can you really convey a feeling? Isn't it impossible? Description is insufficient. So he's describing the writing process less as a verbal endeavor and more as a physical activity in which he's creating images on a page. He's not really writing, but more drawing. Letters merge to form words and then phrases like small brush strokes that <coughs> blend together to produce an image. Through his, though his early stages of writing, Tolstoy is mostly concerned with description, he still throughout um, expresses an intense unease with the written word and its inability to convey meaning to the reader, the ability of a verbal art to portray the visual. What I propose is that Tolstoy, who is one of the most prominent and prolific figures in Russian literature and European realism, sees himself more as a painter than a writer. In his description of the creative process, he portrays a space resembling an artist's studio more than a writer's desk, a paint-spattered palette more than a sheet of writing paper. In the most basic understanding of an incredibly complex concept, realism is the attempt of the artist, either visual or verbal or otherwise, to truthfully portray the world. Um, from the very start of his career in an 1855 short story, Set of Sopel in May, Tolstoy discusses his need to communicate truth to his reader. He writes, the hero of my tale, whom I love with all, my, all the power of my soul, whom I have tried to portray in all his beauty, who has been, is, and will be beautiful, is truth. But it's important to keep in mind that we're talking about what Tolstoy thought was true. Um, and his truth is far from objective. That's one thing that people kind of misconstrue about realism, is that it's an objective representation of the world. But really, it's, it's Tolstoy telling you he's being objective when he's not being objective. Um, his unique experience of reality is overwhelmingly visual, and his distrust of the written word causes him to borrow techniques from other media. What my dissertation looks at as a whole is Tolstoy's changing relationship with truth as it manifests in a visual aesthetic. And today I'm just going to talk about the two extremes of this aesthetic um, that bookend his literary career. Throughout his career, Tolstoy redefines his relationship with the visual 
and by the end, because it becomes clear that he's presenting images in a very different manner to the reader than he was at the beginning. He no longer uses detailed descriptions of nature, vast panoramas, wide spectrums of color. His earlier works are more detailed than the later ones, and they focus more on meticulous, uh, more on plot than meticulous description. His early works feature extended descriptions, a rich color palette, fluidity, movement, and a frequently interrupted narrative flow. And this type of aesthetic I call his painterly aesthetic. With time, as we go through his work, you see that color drains from Tolstoy's writing, culminating in an almost exclusively black and white color scheme in his novel Resurrection from 1899. Descriptions become brief and less detailed. The constrained and blunt visuality of these works mirror <coughs> Tolstoy's self-restraint and uh, philosophical clarity. Following what he called a religious conversion in the early 1880s, he writes with increasing conviction and confidence about what he considered to be right and wrong. His use of contrast, the play between positive and negative space, black and white imagery, as well as increased linearity of the narrative, comprise what I'm going to call his uh, draftsmanly or sculptural aesthetic. So that's later on in his, in his work. Before I can really get into the analysis of any of the texts, I have to give a little theoretical context, but I promise I'll keep it as short as I can. Um, so pe people have compared literature and painting for so long and so much that they're referred to as the sister arts. And for the most part, the consensus was that painting and poetry try to do the same thing, that is, portray reality, truthfully. Um, in 1766, a German writer, um, Gotthold Lessing, wrote an influential essay on what he called um, the limits of painting and poetry. And he explores the fundamental properties of the literary and visual arts and concludes that literature is innately temporal and the visual arts, is, the visual arts are spatial. He explains that while a writer can portray a sequence of events and include any number of actions set in the past, present, future, or combination, the painter is limited to a single moment in time. In the most basic terms, he's arguing that literature deals with time and painting deals with space. Um, in response to Lessing many years later, in 1945, uh, literary critic Joseph Frank discusses, oh, I have pictures of them, um, discusses the relationship between literature and time and space. He doesn't divide the arts on the basis of temporality and spatiality like Lessing, um, but rather explains how literature can have properties of spatial art. He argues that it's possible to trace the evolution of both art forms by their oscillations between these two poles, and that modern literature is starting to move towards spatial form. Spatiality and temporality in literature can be discussed respectively in terms of description and plot progression. Authors of spatial literary works consciously or not combat the dominance of temporality by interrupting or slowing the progression of plot. Um, and they do this through a variety of literary devices, including extended imagery, complicated syntax, repetition, multiple narrative lines, and something Tolstoy is known for, defamiliarization, which is making the familiar strange in, a very, in, in various ways. Um, by temporarily halting the progression of plot, the author creates moments of stasis, um, and the reader is arrested in time. So the experience of reading is more like stopping to look at a painting or a sculpture, and less the traditional left to right um, progression of you know, reading from a page. And in his painterly um, aesthetic, which I've kind of got represented by uh, an illustration from War and Peace, one of his earlier works, I have found more spatial qualities in, the, in these works in his earlier ones, and more temporal qualities in his later works, the sculptural ones. And I'm going to discuss the earlier works by using the short story Lucerne from 1857 as an example of this painterly, more spatial aesthetic. Um, let's see. So, when I first read Lucerne, so this is a picture of Lucerne, it's a town in Switzerland, um, it struck me more as a series of pictures than a traditional storyline. Of course, there are things that happen in the plot and it moves forward, but they aren't what dominate the work. The short story contains many features of spatial literature, including a heavy reliance on description rather than action, and a plot that Tolstoy constantly interrupts with instances of extended imagery, detailed descriptions, and repetition. 
Unlike his other works, Tolstoy limits himself to almost a single location in Lucerne. In all, the action takes place in only two places, majority in the dining room of an elegant hotel, which you can see here, and um, the rest on the street outside, but mostly inside the dining room. There are too many images, verbal paintings, like I call them in my dissertation, in Lucerne to discuss all of them, so I've only chosen a couple to talk about today, um, namely descriptions of landscapes and visual representations of society as a whole, but I promise there's a lot more. Um, Lucerne features several vivid descriptions of the Swiss landscape. Um, Tolstoy doesn't arbitrarily list details of surrounding nature for the sake of truthful representation, but he uses a series of images to help illustrate each scene as a cohesive whole. And the composition of Tolstoy's nature descriptions um, is consistent with that of traditional landscape painting. So this isn't a painting by Tolstoy or by a Russian author. It's just it's a, a painting that I have as a good example of some of this traditional composition that I'm, that I'm going to talk about. One aspect is um, com of composition in painting and photography is the rule of thirds, which is the division of the picture plane into thirds, um, both vertically and horizontally. So it's kind of forcing the artist to space out the most important things in the picture plane instead of putting everything in one corner or in the middle. This kind of gives you uh, a harmonious whole. The horizontal divisions correspond to what are called the first, middle, and far planes in Russian, so Pirvi plan, Sredni plan, Dalny plan. Um, and looking at paintings since the Renaissance, particularly landscapes, the space of the painting is divided into three zones, and there are corresponding color palettes for each, which are obviously general, but the foreground is brown, um, the second con is comprised of greens, and the most distant would be the blue. So you can see that really clearly in this in this painting here. Um, moving from foreground to background, colors shift from warm tones, like reds, browns, and oranges, to colder tones, like blues, grays, and purples. And there are some moments in Lucerne which look, at least to me, almost exactly like this kind of painting structure. So I apologize for my really long quote, but I promise it's important. Um, the lake, light blue like burning sulfur and dotted with little boats, which left vanishing tracks behind them, seemed motionless, smooth, and convex before my windows. While it spread out between its variegated green shores, then passed, darkening, uh, then passed into the distance where it narrowed between two enormous um, promontories, and darkening <laughs> leaned against and disappeared among the pile of mountains, clouds, and glaciers that towered one above another. In the foreground were the moist, fresh green, far-stretching shores with their reeds, meadows, gardens, and chalets. And further off, and um, yeah, were the dark green wooded. No, I just said that. No, I didn't. <laughs> I don't have my reading glasses on. Sorry. Um, Promontories crowned by ruined castles, and in the background was the rugged purple-white distance with the fantastic, rocky, dull white, snow-covered mountain crests. The whole bathed in the delicate, transparent azure of the of the air and lit up by warm sunset rays and pierced by torn clouds. So you can really see this kind of three-part uh, division of the picture plane that he's making. And you can see that it kind of corresponds to the, the different color gradations as well. He's using color and line in his description of the Swiss landscape in, in this three-part structure. and. He's using the, the terms from visual arts, Pierre Viplan, right, foreground. And like the carefully planned lines in painting, he's guiding his reader through the landscape, guiding your eye from one element to the other. One feature of the scene bleeds into the next, drawing the reader, now turned viewer, from the lake to mountains to shore and back to the scene as a whole. Each of the three major planes in the description feature the color schemes traditional to the first, middle, and far plans in painting. And he uses the play of color, light, and shadow to give the picture fluidity. Rays of light pierce the clouds, and caps of snow highlight areas in the landscape, helping break it up, like we saw in those in that grid, right? So he has kind of a balanced composition where there are elements in each different part. He creates movement without relying on the forward progression of plot. The protagonist, whose name is Dmitry Nikliudov, doesn't walk around the lake or down by the shore when he's describing this. 
Instead, he's stationary before his window, and the outlines of this window act as a frame for this verbal painting. So you're really, he's really stopping the reader in, in one moment. Tolstoy is using color and line to divide the world of Lucerne in two as well. For example, he's painting a portrait of the English guests in the hotel using shades of white, and he, he doesn't like the English guests at the hotel, as I think you'll be able to tell. So he's got a sea of white images that overwhelm Nikhilov when he is surveying the hotel dining room. And he's repeating the same adjectives. So he says, on all sides, the whitest of laces, the whitest of collars, whitest of natural and artificial teeth, whitest of complexions and hands, and the whitest of hands and gloves with rings, moved only to adjust a collar. He directs the reader's attention to the whiteness of the English again when he, a few pages later, comments on gentlemen with the whitest of collars, the whitest of caps and blouses. And um, in his description of the guests and their surroundings, he's focusing exclusively on visual elements instead of personality traits, behaviors, or um, attitudes. The extended imagery within this description, along with the repetition of the adjective whitest, Belieshi, not only halts the progression of plot in the story, but it also creates kind of a cohesive portrait of, of society as a whole. And in this next um, passage, you'll see he's using the color white again, along with line, to link his image of the English people in the dining room to civilization as a whole, which is, if you've read Tolstoy, something he talks about a lot, right? So society, civilization, bad, nature, good, pretty much. Um, so neither on the lake, nor in the mountains, nor in the sky was there a single precise line or one precise color, or one unchanging moment. Everywhere was motion, irregularity, fantastic shapes, an endless intermingling and variety of shades and lines, and over it all lay tranquility, softness, unity, and the ineff ineffability of the beautiful. And here, before my very window, amid this undefined, confused, unfettered beauty, the straight white line of the quay stretched stupidly and artificially within, with its lime trees, their supports, and the green benches, miserable, vulgar human productions which did not blend with the general harmony of the beauty as did the distant chalets and, ru and ruins, but on the contrary clashed, cor clashed coarsely with it. My eyes continually encountered that dreadful straight quay, and I felt a desire to push it away or demolish it as I would wipe off a black smudge I could see on my nose. But the embankment with the English people walking on it remained where it was. So he's clearly really upset. <laughs> upset. But I think it's interesting the way he's using white here and straight lines, which you kind of associate with man-made things, as opposed to the, the living, moving, undefined, um, more, more painterly uh, lines of nature. He's juxtaposing the rigidity, pallor, and lifelessness of the bridge which represents civilization with the movement, color, and imprecision of the natural world. The bridge disfigures the face of the landscape around it like a scar. And later in the story, Tolstoy also uses lines to show the artificial and divisive relationship, uh, relations of civilization with the natural world in general, while Nikhilov is thinking about the events of, of the story that just took place. He includes their relation to the concept, of, concept and practice of equality. Western civilization versus the undeveloped societies of the rest of the world, and man's desire for order and control. He explains that, as a result of this need for order, men have made subdivisions for themselves. They've traced imaginary lines on that ocean, and expect the ocean to divide itself accordingly, as if, it were not, if, as if there were not millions of other subdivisions made from quite other points on another plane. So he's repeating the image of an unnatural man-made line, dividing nature into segments. The straight white bridge fractures the landscape in the same way that these imaginary borders of different nations sever the globe. So the handling of space and visuality in Lucerne, um, just like the rest of Tolstoy's works, speak to his philosophical conceptions at the time. Throughout his life, Tolstoy's philosophy greatly informed his fiction. So the young Tolstoy, only 29 when he wrote and published Lucerne, experienced a strong urge to love and be loved by his fellow man. He writes of the harmonious need of, eternal and, of the eternal and infinite, the beginning of life's spiritual and moral journey, and the seemingly endless potential of youth. These feelings find their voice in the protagonist, Nikhilov, looking out at the vast Swiss landscape from his window. He explains how he can suddenly 
feel the need to express an excess of something in his soul. The expanse of the landscape becomes an, an image of the whole universe, the harmonious world in which he would dwell later in his life. In the short time frame of Lucerne, Neclutiv describes a number of strong emotional and intellectual reactions to various stimuli, stimuli in the hotel and in the town, and he begins the story overwhelmed with a thirst for life, community, and fraternal love, colored by his youthful optimism. Once in the hotel dining room, frustration and anger replace his earlier exuberance, and he ruminates at length on a number of moral issues, including equality and the tension between instinct and rationality. The nature of art and the evils of human nature demonstrated by violent acts of imperialist nations, um, like talking about severing the globe. His varied ethical musings create in Lucerne what is called an open form narrative. And open form works focus on the exploration of different ideas and beliefs, while closed forms, which we'll look at in a minute, assert a specific idea or belief. Tolstoy's use of open forms in this narrative corresponds with his depiction of open spaces, so these vast nature descriptions, wide open spaces, um, which you see not just in Lucerne, but throughout, even through Anna Karenina. Um, with time, both the form of his narrative and physical spaces in his work shift from open and expansive to closed and restricted. As Tolstoy grows older, the world seems smaller and time less infinite. While the fear of impending death takes more of a hold on him, spaces in his fiction become increasingly constricting. He moves from the color and seemingly in, in seeming infinity of the Swiss landscape that we just saw in Lucerne to prison cells and stuffy courtrooms in the 1899 novel Resurrection. The treatment of space, inevitably linked with the visual spatial, spatial aspects of Tolstoy's fiction, change alongside his moral, spiritual, and philosophical evolution. The reliance on visual remains a constant throughout his writing, as the following, of, following discussion of resurrection will show, moving from fluidity, color, and painterly to um, a control, achromaticity, and austerity of this more sculptural aesthetic in, in resurrection. So his, his later writings reform old themes, characters, and literary devices to fit into this new, more controlled aesthetic. He turns his attention to a more concrete goal than in his, than in his earlier works and focuses now on a character's epiphany rather than the process of exploration. He fits art into confines of a more linear narrative. So the Neclutive of Lucerne is only just beginning his process of moral investigation. In Resurrection, the same character, Dimitri Neclutive, is depicted at the end of his moral journey, working to make manifest the moral code he's already almost completely adopted. So you're going from progression to strict right and wrong. And in Resurrection, Tolstoy is no longer lingering on descriptions, but providing the reader with the bare necessities to visualize a scene. The novel is not devoid of description, obviously, but it, it does lack the verbal portraits of his earlier works. Instead of detailed accounts of characters' physical appearances, he provides a basic outline and emphasizes only one or two physical traits. And what I propose is that the spatial qualities of resurrection are more sculptural than the ones seen in Lucerne, which are more painterly. He even compares himself to a sculptor in a letter when he's discussing the novel Resurrection. He writes, the fact is, like the clever portraitist and sculptor Trubitskoy, so Pavel Trubitskoy, who is, you can see him right here making this bust of Tolstoy. Tolstoy's pouting in the corner. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, is, is occupied only with what is necessary to convey facial expression. Eyes are thus the main thing for me. Spiritual life was expressed in scenes, and he says, I can't rework these scenes. So he's focusing just on one or two details. Resurrection features several instances of this device typical for Tolstoy, in which a character's body, part, or mannerism morphs into kind of a physical epithet. In his descriptions of the main female character, Katusha Maslova, Tolstoy repeatedly mentions her curly black hair, prominent chest, and like Trubitskoy, calls particular attention to her eyes. In the first description of her, he writes, the strongest feature of her face were her eyes, jet black against the dull pallor of her skin. And he'll go on to mention her eyes almost every time he talks about her, using almost the same phrasing. These limited descriptions are often achromatic, featuring the juxtaposition of black and white images like we saw with her hair 
um, standing out strikingly black against her white skin or white clothing. This play between negative and positive space also has a sculptural quality, while the precision and starkness of the limited descriptions recall ink drawings. One scholar links Tolstoy's use of contrasting images with his study of sculpture. In 1866, he studied sculpture at the um, he studied sculpture at the School of Painting, Sculpture, and Architecture. And this um, scholar, whose name is Jill Dury, she says, the contrast suggests to us that Tolstoy, in his study of sculpture, was well aware of the power of contraposto. And this is a sculptural technique. Um, it's from Italian, meaning set against. It's used it to describe poses in which figures turn away from one another, though it's used in sculpture. It's also used in painting now, too. But kind of this idea of contrast and just focusing on, on certain body parts or certain um, facial features to get your, get your point across. And Resurrection is rife with striking contrast. The novel begins with a description of the city and features the juxtaposition of natural and urban environments as well as a juxtaposition of adults and children, and he links these ideas. He gives a multi-sensory clash between man and nature and describes people as clogging the land with stones to make sure nothing could grow. Their elimination of every last grass shoot, the fumes from coal and oil, and the lopping of trees and the driving out of animals and birds. He shows the city as a deadening force which exists in continuous conflict with nature's um, <coughs> vivacity. And in a related contrast, he compares adult members of society, which he connects with the urban environment, with um, civilization in general. Uh, and he, he contrasts this with children who he lists in his, his images of nature. So he says, joy was everywhere in plants and birds, insects, and children. So children aren't even really people yet. They're part of the natural world. For them, the sacred and the significant meant anything they could devise to gain power over others. And this is something he says about the adults. Right? They saw nothing sacred or significant in the spring morning. Tolstoy uses visual and olfactory imagery to further the contrast between city and nature, describing the dark, stinking corridor of the prison and the blast of air that stank worse than the corridor that was emitted when the door of the prison was opened. He contrasts this with a description of the fresh and invigorating air in the yard, which is something he discusses immediately afterwards. He repeats the contrast a second time and explains how, in the corridor, the air was heavy with typhus, saturated with the stench of sewage, tar, putrefaction, and it immediately reduced all newcomers to a state of depression and despondency. Here again, he's connecting the internal man-made spaces with death and, death and stagnation. Consistent with Lucerne, he's connecting open natural spaces with life and movement. So he's, you can see a real difference here. Um, and the use of contrast is obviously nothing new for Tolstoy. The struggle between natural and civilized worlds appears in works as early as Lucerne. But in this short piece, the sparing, but, in, but it is in this short, precise, and sparing manner of exposition seen in Resurrection, particularly the use of black and white binaries that differs from his previous works. Tolstoy trades a color palette seen in landscape depictions in Lucerne for more achromatic divisionist handling of color. White and black are by far the most prominent colors in the novel and contribute to the overall visual tone of the work. The words for white and black appear over 100 times each in the novel, not including similar words like pale, dark, light, and this greatly exceeds the mention of any other color in the novel. I counted. <laughs> um, these black and white pairings often coincide with and underscore the juxtaposition of moral and immoral forces. So again, we see the visual kind of underscoring Tolstoy's philosophical ideas. For, for example, when the Kluvev looks out a window, he sees a tall, leafless tree which casts sharp shadows of its forking, spreading branches onto neatly kept sandy ground. On his left, a shed roof shone white in the bright morning. Straight ahead, the black shadow of the wall could be dimly seen through the interwoven branches of the trees. The dark shadow cutting across the white facade, as well as the image of the fourth branches, echoes the two lives that pull at Nikhilov, the animal and the spiritual selves that battle within him, which is something that Tolstoy talks about a lot in the novel. Over several pages, Tolstoy describes this internal struggle 
However, the internal division is most strikingly is most striking in the image of this forked tree trunk, a single living entity which is pulled in two separate directions. The black shadow against the white building emphasizes this division and emphasizes the idea of right and wrong with traditional color palette. Um, emphasizing the moral contrast is not the only function of such imagery. I also argue that Tolstoy includes many coupling of black and white or light and dark imagery to create an overall visual tone of the work. So you kind of get this more austere, controlled aesthetic in Resurrection as opposed to in earlier works. Contrasts appear again in his use of space. Unlike in earlier works, the action of Resurrection takes place almost exclusively indoors. He trades his panoramic views of battlefields and country estates for confines of courthouses, prison cells, and other buildings. Even the scenes that take place outside feature a sense of confinement, and they are mostly a description of prisoners marching in strict lines. This confined use of space changes the visual aesthetic. Unlike in many paintings where the artist can depict open space in the distance or allude to space outside the picture plane, sculpture by nature deals with enclosed forms. And in a letter, again in 1899, Tolstoy compares descriptions and resurrection with sculpture and drawing. He writes, um, this is a letter to Tolstoy, I'm sorry, from Vladimir Satsov. He writes, you draw and sculpt such things which tyrannize and outrage everyone, but which no one dares or is capable of putting before our eyes. What innovation and force, such amazing and convex sculpture, such characters like living people. Tolstoy, who's now 71 years old, no longer relates to the infinite potential that lay out before Nikolaev in Lucerne. Having struggled with fear of death and the meaning of life for decades now, the world appears much smaller. As if preparing himself for death, he deals mostly with dark and finite spaces in this last novel. The stuffy courtroom or bad-smelling hallway of the prison, crowded cells, spaces that make up Nikhilov and Maslova's present are contrasted with the fresh, open, light space of country estate in the summer where they first fell in love. <clears throat> Their first kiss occurs during a game of tag played outside in front of the house, and this scene includes several mentions of movement, light, and open spaces. The, contra the contrast between the imprisoned Maslova and the young Katusha running on nimble, lively young legs is really striking. Tolstoy is interrupting the forward progression of plot with this extended flashback, and he moves back in time, not only in terms of his characters' lives, but also in regard to his own aesthetic. The reader briefly re-encounters visual elements of the early Tolstoy. Before he began to recall scenes from the past, Nikhilov exited the courtroom, walked out into the jury room, and sat down by a window. So again, we have this idea of framing by a window. The reader can picture Nikhilov gazing out as he begins to remember. Yes, it was Katusha, just as he frames the landscape painting in Lucerne by having Nikhilov view it through his hotel room window, Tolstoy again frames his more painterly scene with a window. It is also in this flashback that almost the only color in the novel take place. Um, he talks about red silk scarves and short velvet jackets, bright red blouses, gaily colored skirts, blue, red, green um, of peasant figures in the novel. In his return to this earlier aesthetic, Tolstoy sets Nikhilov's seduction of Maslova, and he's linking his earlier painterly style that he's using to describe this scene with his youthful, sinful behavior. So Tolstoy rejected his earlier works after he had this conversion, saying that you know he was he was being a counterfeit artist, and he disowned Anna Karenina, calling them. Um, calling works like that unconscious creations. And now that he's older and wiser, he's got it all figured out, and he's retracing his steps um, and trying to fix earlier mistakes. So Nikhilov earlier in the novel mentions that he had abandoned his pursuit of landscape painting. He explains that he had, if he had continued painting, he would be working on that picture, which would never get finished now, because it wouldn't be right for me to carry on with such stupid things. I can't do anything like that anymore. It's in this moment that Tolstoy speaks directly through his character about his own artistic experience. Looking back and condemning his earlier writing in the light of his new philosophy and corresponding aesthetic, Tolstoy decides that he can't continue in the same fashion. His earlier work, which shares many stylistic and compositional elements with landscape painting, painting must be abandoned, as it's, it no longer fits with his new, more prohibitive worldview. So Tolstoy and Nikhilov both turn away from unfinished landscape paintings, returning to them only through the concept of memory. Thank you. Thank you.